Good morning. My name is Dr. Mark Langner. I'm so glad to have you with us today. This is Revelation chapter 5. If you have not been with us for our other weeks, those are uh, those weeks are available on the Crosspoint Church, Madison, Alabama, uh, Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So please feel free to go back and watch those at your convenience. Thank you again for joining us. We are going to jump right into chapter five. I'm going to share my screen with you so that you're able to see what I am looking at. And uh, we'll start today with a quick review of our Revelation rhymes. I believe that these help us. I was inspired to do this again by evangelist Mark Correll, and I really enjoyed learning these. I've adapted these uh, a little bit, but uh, Revelation chapter one, a picture of the eternal son. Revelation chapter two, work of the church to do. Revelation chapter three, where should our church be? And Revelation chapter four, God worshiped by 24 and more. So these rhymes, I do believe, help us out uh, to understand what each chapter is about. Again, Revelation is given, I believe, mostly in a chronological order. A couple of times we'll have what we call parenthetical uh, chapters, which are there to give us more details about other events within the Revelation, and we'll let you know when we get there. Um, but chapter five is, uh, is Revelation chapter five, Jesus the Lamb Alive. You'll remember last week in chapter four, we talked a lot about God the Father. Well, this week we're going to talk about God the Son. Keep in mind that Jesus is the central character of the book of Revelation. Um, uh, you'll remember that John said, uh, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That theme is going to run completely through Revelation chapter 5, and I believe that as we talk today, you're going to get a picture of Jesus. You'll remember from chapter 1, this astounding picture of Jesus that John the Apostle gave us when he was on the island of Patmos in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And you'll also remember that at the end of chapter 1, uh, that, that, that Jesus said these things must take place after this, and then he talked about the churches. And so then we talked about the churches in Asia, when I believe that everything Jesus said to the churches in Asia can be found in the churches of all times, including today. And so we need to remember all the things that Jesus said. But then in chapter four, we find that John is taken uh, through a vision into heaven. And we again find these words, and after this, so we know that this again is chronological. And these are important things to remember as you study the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, we also talked last week about, uh, about the songs of the apocalypse, uh, as Robert Coleman said. And there are three here that we'll talk about today. That's the most in any chapter in Revelation. There are three different songs. The new song of the redemption, which will start in uh, verses 9 and 10. The angels choral in 512. And then the crescendo of the universe in 513 and 14. We're going to find that at some point in time, everyone will offer praise and worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow, the Bible tells us, uh, at, the, at, the, at the foot of the cross, at the foot of Jesus. That does not necessarily mean that every person will be saved, um, but it does mean that every person has the opportunity to be saved. And we'll talk about that as we go through today. Hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, particular study. I've enjoyed very much getting prepared for it. And we're going to see here in the this first part of Revelation chapter 5 that Jesus makes a grand entrance. Now, this is not the first time that, that, uh, that Jesus has made a, a grand entrance uh, in Scripture uh, when he came into uh, when we when we learn about Jesus in the gospel, we find that he made a grand entrance in early Luke and in early Matthew, where we learn about the birth of Jesus Christ, that we get to see um, 
how he at 12 years old made a grand entrance even at the temple gates and and uh worship and and leading scholars there and his parents were looking for him so jesus has made a grand entrance a couple of times even before he's an adult and when we get to his adulthood and the beginning of his ministry he made a grand entrance into many people's lives one of those was Mary Magdalene. I uh, have recently uh, began watching the series, The Chosen, and the first uh, episode is about Mary Magdalene. And that's just a, uh, a narration of an actual event. Not everything uh, pictured there is necessarily the way that it was, but I think that they got it pre pretty, uh, pretty they, they did it pretty well. Um, we know that Mary had seven devils. Jesus delivered her from those, and then she faithfully followed him all the way up to the point where she was the first person that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. So what a great honor for her and how greatly her name is honored today. This was a person that was not living for God, and then, and then Jesus made a grand entrance into her life, and then she was living for God. We also saw that, of course, with the woman at the well, unnamed, but so important in John chapter four, uh, where she just came to the well for water and left with living water, scripture tells us. And we know that from the woman caught in adultery, uh, where Jesus said that her sins were forgiven, but to go and sin no more. Um, there was no one left to condemn her because we've all sinned before God. We've all come short of the glory of God. And then, of course, all the apostles, Jesus invaded every one of their lives, uh, Paul to the point of, of, of blinding him and falling down. So we have the 12 apostles, in the, and uh, including Matthias and plus Paul. And so we have these amazing pictures of Jesus invading this world changing this world he's in and, and how appropriate that is because he is the one who spoke the world into existence so that's how we start today and we start with uh, the first verse of chapter five then i saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides sealed with seven seals i also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look out in it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So we have this picture here of, of this scroll with seven seals. Now, seven, again, is the number of, of perfection. It's the number of completeness. So this is a plan of God here, and it is complete. The Lord is giving John and the church, you and me, a glimpse of what's going to take place in the future, and he's giving us a glimpse into heaven. So if you want to know what heaven is like, there are multiple chapters in the Revelation that talk about this. We saw it in chapter 4. We saw it in chapter 5. We're going to see it periodically throughout the Revelation, but particularly in the end from, uh, from 20 to 22. We're going to get a, a real understanding of what heaven is like, the constant worship of the Lamb of God. You'll notice some verses here. Then a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. I'm about to bring uh, my servant, the branch. Here is a man whose name is Branch. So this root of David uh, is Jesus Christ himself. He is the Messiah. When these verses were written in Isaiah and Zechariah, it was the future Messiah. It was the coming Messiah. And now Jesus has already come. He has fulfilled these prophecies that we see here in Isaiah and Zechariah, and I've given you the references um, in your notes, and you'll be able to look at those yourself. I think it's really important in Scripture uh, that you look at the Old Testament prophecies and then look at the fulfillment of those prophecies in Jesus Christ. Um, and, we, and we see here 
that this is the warrior lamb of God. So uh, the elders, uh, remember the 24 elders, I believe that these are the 12 apostles. Um, and we don't know if it's Matthias or Paul, but 12 apostles of Jesus. And I believe uh, 12 representatives from the tribe, the tribes of Israel. One of these elders said to him, hey, look, don't weep. So this idea of there's not any weeping, the, the, the Bible says he'll wipe, wipe away all of our tears. Um, but you see here, right here in this heavenly scene, that John wept and wept. I don't know if you've ever anticipated so much something so much that you just about can't wait. You see that with kids all the time, particularly around Christmas. I just, you know, they, they just can't, buy, you know, it's like they can't hold it in. They just almost can't wait for the event to happen. And this is something where John knew he was getting some new information, some new revelation from Jesus Christ. And he, he, he was on pins and needles, as they say. He just couldn't wait to hear it. And he was weeping um, because there was no one found worthy. And you'll see that there were no angels. There were no humans. There were no demons even. Uh, no one was able uh, to open this up. And, and the elder said, wait, 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 the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. How amazing that thought is, that Jesus Christ has conquered the grave, he has conquered our sin, and he is worthy. He is the one worthy of our worship. He is the one who, uh, who spoke, again, this world into existence. You are here because of the spoken word of Jesus Christ. We'll see here uh, some verses, again, prophecies, and I'm going to read the King James Version. I've been using the Christian Standard Bible, and I've given you that here as well, but I like the King James with this, these two verses. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from beneath between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So today in this scripture, you're going to see a fulfillment um, in chapter five of these verses. And in these verses, we'll see that Shiloh will come. The Messiah is coming. That gathering will take place and his people will be there with him. And of course, again, Jesus was from the, from the tribe of Judah. So he's the lion of Judah, the Messiah, the promised one. And so you also see here uh, this scroll. And before we get back into the description of Jesus, we'll talk about the, the, uh, the scroll. Some people believe that the, the scroll is the law. We know it was written on the inside and the outside. Some people believe it's the gospel message. Others, the new covenant. Uh, some people believe that this is the book of life. Other scholars believe that these are decrees of God. And then finally, some people believe that is the plan of redemption. I would tell you that it's probably a combination of some of these, but what I primarily believe it to be, um, as uh, Henson says, as um, Aiken says, and several other scholars I really trust, is kind of a last will and testament. You know, when we make a last will and testament, we're saying this is what we want to happen after I'm gone. Well, this is more, uh, this is more profound than that. This is Jesus saying, that this is not what I want to happen. This is what will happen. This is God and his sovereignty telling us what's going to happen uh, in the end days. I believe that we are created in freedom, that he gives us all the choice, uh, all the freedom to choose to follow him or not, and how sad it is when people choose not to do so. But we know that ultimately God's plan will be done in his sovereignty. He has seen the last days. And this is a decree of a, what is about to take place. So this is a future decree. And so these seals are sealed up. We'll talk in chapter six about the seals of, of the apocalypse. We're finally getting into this culmination of Israel. And before we could get there, Jesus talked about his character and who he is. John described him. We understood what he wants the church, churches of that time to do and the church of today to do until he returns for his church. 
And then we understand that there's this, there's this completeness, this culmination of Israel and the times for them, the 70th week of Daniel. So we'll get into that beginning next week. And these seals that you see in chapter five are the beginnings of, of that. And then, so John, uh, he turned to see this lion of Judah, and this is what he saw. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, you remember the seraphim, and among the elders that we've already talked about today. He had seven horns and seven eyes, so here's this completeness again, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And again, this is from uh, from Isaiah, and we've talked about this repeatedly, and I'll show you again in just a moment. He went out and he took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. So, so John, the apostle, turned to look for the Lion of Judah. And when he looked for the Lion of Judah, he found the warrior Lamb of God. He sees this triumphant version of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's the same Christ who walked on the earth during the Gospels. It's the same Christ that we have the descriptions of his birth, where he, uh, where he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and given to Mary. And we know that this is the same Jesus that his stepfather, if you will, Joseph took care of uh, for a number of years and who gave him an earthly trade. This is that warrior lamb of God with the, with the nail prints in his hand and the nail prints in his feet and the, and the wound, in the scar from his side uh, where, where he was stabbed. It is the warrior lamb of God. He is promised over and over through scripture. In Genesis, we have this picture of Abraham taking up Isaac, his only son, scripture says, to sacrifice him there. And God said, I'll provide a ram. And so we have this idea here of Jesus being provided for us. That was a shadow and type of what was to come. And you'll see other scriptures here. And for the sake of time, I won't go through each of these, but you should. Exodus and Isaiah and John that describes Jesus and his work here in First Peter, and then multiple scriptures in the Revelation that talk about Jesus as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God um, is used in the Revelation 28 different times. This is a prevailing theme. Jesus is the Lamb. Um, and you'll remember Jesus is on uh, parables about the sheep door and about all of these different parables where we are sheep as Christians uh, and that he is our shepherd and we are to follow him. And there's this shadowing type of that, even in the 23rd Psalm, where, where we picture Jesus uh, as the shepherd of David, of course, um, and Jesus was in the lineage of David, uh, was a shepherd. So this king was a shepherd. So, so important godly people are, are known as shepherds. And we see this, this warrior lamb of God, no longer the meek uh, picture of Jesus that we saw in the gospels, but instead the triumphant conquering Jesus. This is the one who is worthy to take the scroll out of the right hand of God, the father on his throne. And we'll see these descriptions again, uh, and I'll get, and we've been through these several times, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So these attributes of the Holy Spirit. And again, we are going to get a picture that the Holy Spirit and Jesus, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit are working in conjunction. And in this particular passage, we get a picture of the right hand of God the Father, we get Jesus, the Lamb of God, uh, the the Lion of Judah, Judah, and then you also have this picture of the Holy Spirit. So again, the Godhead always works in perfect conjunction, is always unanimous in, in God's will. It is, it is three in one. We're going to talk about this soon as pastors uh, for all of our adults and children in the church. We're going to talk about the Trinity and, and who 
God is in the Trinity. Uh, so many people miss this, but we have to understand that in the Revelation, we get amazing pictures of the Trinity and how the Godhead works together for his will. When Jesus was baptized, you'll remember he went up immediately from the water, Scripture tells us. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So again, this picture uh, all the way back when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist of the, of the Trinity in unity. And then again, at the birth of Jesus, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is being conceived in here, in her, this, this says in here, it's supposed to be in her, is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And I've given you multiple verses here that describe Jesus the Father, Jesus the Son, Jesus the Holy Spirit, working in conjunction with each other. There are amazing passages here that I absolutely love of Simeon and Anna. When they see Jesus, they, it talks about them being in the, the Spirit. So we, we have John the, the Apostle here in the Spirit getting this revelation from Jesus himself, and we know that, that Spirit-led people like um, uh, like Simeon and Anna were waiting on Jesus to be there, and they got to see the fulfillment um, in their own time. And then we see this song here. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. We're going to be doing a lot of falling, and how amazing that will be, because those of us who have gotten a little bit older and our knees are not what they used to be, you will not have to worry about that in heaven. You will be able to fall down before the lamb and you will be compelled to fall down before the lamb and each one had a harp and a golden bowl uh, golden bowls filled with incense which are the prayers of the saints and i'm going to pause here if you ever feel that your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and bouncing off i i promise you that they're not the bible says that our righteous prayers those that are not prayed selfishly uh, the Bible says that when we don't receive something, it's, not, it's because we're not praying for the right thing. Um, but, but and, and sometimes the Lord makes us wait on things in prayer. But you need to understand that your prayers, are, if you are saved, your prayers are heard by God himself. They're before the throne. These are the prayers of Christians, and they're there. And then it says this, and they sang a new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on the earth. What an amazing picture. First, Jesus is the only one worthy to take the scroll from the Father. He is the only one who is able to open its seals, and he's able to do that because he obediently was slaughtered. That word is important. You, we need to understand that what Jesus went through was tremendous. It was unbelievable. It was incredible. It was an unaltering, triumphant role that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the sinless one who purchased us by his blood, the atonement that made us at one with Christ. As Pastor John recently preached, we are at one with him because of this atonement. And look at who is at one with him people from every tribe, from every language from every people, from every nation. It is fine for us, again, to love our own nation that we're born into, to love the nation of Israel, which is God's chosen people forever. They will be God's chosen people. They've always been since he established them as his people. That is an eternal promise, and we are grafted into that family. But notice this here, every tribe and language and people and nation in China, there's a great church. 
It's underground and persecuted. In Iran, there is a great church. It is under uh, persecution, tremendous persecution. In various Muslim countries around this world, there are Christians who are having to be careful in their worship and have to be careful in how open they are because even their own families will kill them. We need to understand that there will be people from every tribe and that Jesus loves this entire world, every nation, all the way down to every single individual person. That's who the cross is for. And we're going to see that people from every nation respond. And look what he says. You made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on the earth. You will rule and reign with Jesus Christ himself. That's incredible. You think about your sin and your past, and I think about my sin and my past, and it's and we we can't comprehend how God could use people like us. But again, the word says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus, in this beautiful picture of grace, I remember uh, reading a, a book called Ragamuffin by Brennan Manning, and in this book. He talks about all of us are ragamuffins. All of us are people in need of Jesus Christ. And those of us who accept that uh, free gift of salvation, these are the ones from every tribe and language and people and nation. You'll be, you'll be part of a kingdom, and you'll be kingdom priest, Hebrews tells us, that, that we have a great high priest, Jesus, and he makes us kingdom priest, sharing with him the kingdom that he will establish. And during the millennial reign, which we'll talk about in weeks, far weeks to come, you're going to get an understanding of what you will be doing in that kingdom. Here are some other verses that I love that kind of support these scriptures. Um, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, for the things on the earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Again, that atonement of Christ. And then for us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, the guilt of our sin, Jesus took on himself. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then this last verse, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then these verses, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And then this verse, one of my favorites in scripture, is the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance." I won't tell you that I'm the most patient person in the world. I am definitely not, particularly when I drive, as Becky would tell you. Um, but I will tell you this, that God is patient. That is something that we grow in as we, as we are sanctified in Christ. But the Lord is quite patient. He does not want any person to perish, but all people to come to repentance. And so he delays his coming but at this point, at this time, we're going to see a picture of the rest of Revelation where Jesus has come for his church, and then a new church will be built during the tribulation, which we'll talk about uh, in weeks to, uh, ahead. And then in verse 11, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also of the living creatures and of the elders. So here are the angels and these living creatures, the seraphim, and then these 24 elders, and their number was countless thousands, plus thousands of thousands. A thousand thousands is a million. These are millions of angels here. And they said with a loud voice, worthy is a lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength 
and honor and glory and blessing. And I have read uh, um, that that power and riches and wisdom and strength are not things we can give to God, but that he has within himself. But the honor, the glory, and the blessing, these are things that we can personally offer. Jesus is worthy to receive all of these, and he has received all of these, and will continue to receive all of these. And you'll need to notice, and I, I added some emphasis here from a visual perspective, that these are songs, that these, they're, they're, they're talking through this, but they're singing in this loud voice. And uh, if, if you like a quiet worship service, I think heaven is going to be a real surprise for you because I believe that heaven will be an active, astounding worship, but that it will be in unison and in great voice. And I believe that it will just, it will just be far beyond any huge concert that you've ever been, that these will be so many people that love Jesus Christ who are singing at the same time, and here we have the angels doing it, and the angels have, have not received this, uh, this grace that we've received. The ones of the angels that were sinned were cast out, the Bible tells us, but these angels are singing about the Lamb, and they know and acknowledge who the Lamb of God is. He is worthy. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. In the in uh, God the Son, and they are singing about Him, and then we see this response. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, "Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever." The four living creatures said, "Amen," and the elders fell down and worshipped. And again, we get this picture and this understanding that at the knees, on, at, before Jesus, we will all fall to our knees. Every person that had ever lives, whether they have accepted Christ or not, will bow at the, at, the, at the face of Jesus. They'll bow at the person of Jesus Christ and acknowledge him of Lord, as Lord. I just pray that for most people, they will choose to do that in their lifetime, and not because they are being compelled to, but because they in worship understand that Jesus is the Christ, that we are to live for him right now, today. And I, I said it like this, and I, and I pray that, um, that this glorifies our Lord. Worthy is the Father who gave us his Son. Worthy is the Lamb of God, slaughtered for all humankind. And worthy is the Spirit who works in absolute and complete concert with the Father and the Son. You'll remember from Scripture that the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and the Son. Uh, uh, he is a the Holy Spirit is a person in the Godhead worthy of our worship, and and we will find out in this chapter that His job is to go out throughout the earth um, and to and to convict. And to do so many different things, I believe that often we miss what the Lord is telling us because we're not listening to the Spirit. Jesus said multiple times to his churches in verse in chapters two and three of Revelation, hear what the Spirit is saying, listen to the Spirit, and we'll be singing blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever under the guidance and through the strength and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I love this song. I'm just going to, leave. I'm not going to, to um, I'm certainly not going to sing it for you, uh, but I am going to leave it for you here. Um, this was written by Jenny Lee Riddle. It is the Revelation song. It, I think it was originally sung by Phillips, Craig, and Dean. Uh, my favorite version is Carrie Job's version of this song. It is probably my favorite Christian song of all time. It is taken directly from Revelation chapter 5, which we are, uh, we are going through today. I highly recommend that you just take a moment today that you pull this up on YouTube or whatever uh, you listen to songs on and, uh, and just listen to the words of this song. Holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord God Almighty. And we have this picture of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And you need to understand that he is worthy. And that when he opens the seals, he is the one who has the right to judge. He is the one who has the right and the authority and the ability to forgive. And the only one who can present us spotless before the Father. I hope you've enjoyed today. Here uh, again are uh, the references for this week. Um, there were there were a number of different ones, and I won't go through each of these, but feel free to uh, to look these up yourself. Um, the John Christopher Thomas book, the Ed Henson book, uh, the Danny Aiken book, uh, which is actually not listed here. I did not use it as much this week, um, but all of these. Uh, are, are necessary uh, for a great study of uh, Revelation for me personally. You take of those the ones that you would like to read uh, and think through and pray through, um, but, but tremendous sources for you to look at uh, if you want to do your own study. Thank you again for being with me this week. Next week, we get into the 70th week of Daniel, the breaking open of the seals that are mentioned here. I think you'll enjoy that. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.